Hi there, Maggie Cummings, Hi, the Colin. anthropology professor who I about to interview. So, uh, my first question for you today is: uh, Could you give me sort of a brief, uh, like, academic history or history of ideas? Like, what are some like the major events that led you to the anthropology that you do today? Some of the cool ideas and stories that are sewn into that narrative. Sure, um, might take a while depending how far we we go back, but. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so, um, this could sound weird going back to high school, but I'm going to go back to high school. Mm -hmm. um, when I was in high school, I read, probably when I was in probably grade 11, grade 12, mm -hmm. um, I read, uh, it was when Naomi Wolf's book, The Beauty Myth, came out, mm -hmm. um, which you have probably not necessarily heard of because it actually might have come out before you were born, but uh, was a big, a big deal in the 90s. She's a, she's a feminist um, writer, she's not an academic, but um, who she wrote about sort of the beauty industry, basically, and its effects on women, and all mm -hmm. of the ways in which we are you know, made to feel that we have to be beautiful or else, and all the money and the time that we spend on those mm -hmm. things. Um, and, you know, really sort of um, you know, suggesting at the end of the day that if we put, you know, collectively, if women put as much effort into other endeavors you know, as they do into trying to look, you know, better, thinner, younger, smoother, mm -hmm. all of these things that, um, you know, we would be better, we'd be better off collectively, <laughs> essentially. Um, so, I mean, you can imagine sort of, well, maybe, I mean, you, you can't imagine being a teenage girl, but um, you probably have known some. Uh, you know, th this for me was it was really uh, really eye opening. It really articulated a lot of things that I was sort of experiencing, but couldn't have put words to at the time. So it was a book that really, um, you know, made me in some ways become become a feminist, I suppose. Uh, and introduced me to like a sort of a scholarly way of uh, really thinking about these things. So with that already sort of in my head, I went to I went to university. I went to to York, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and um, initially sort of had the reason that I went to York is because I I wanted to be a screenwriter at the time, and they had a really good screenwriting program. Um, didn't get into the screenwriting program, but got into the, the English program. So I thought, you know, I'll start in English and I'll, I'll shift over. But sort of got there, took a film studies course, realized it might not be for me. Um, not least because the, the screenwriting and production streams at that time were like 95% guys. Um, it didn't seem super friendly. Super friendly to women, but also, I mean, I was... You know, I was a born English major. I loved to read, loved to write. It was great. Mm -hmm. um, so, did you know? Did my English degree? This is, this is really going to be a long, a long explanation. Okay. Uh, so I was working on my English degree, um, and came across, you know, started reading things that that you know, built on Naomi Wolf's work, uh, one of which was uh, Unbearable Weight by Susan Bordeaux, which we actually read in, in the class that we're doing together. Um, so that's sort of thing number one, is I, I, you know, I read that book, I was like, oh, this book's even even better than, than The Beauty Myth, and realized that, you know, you could sort of make a, you know, you could make a, a scholarly career pursuing these these kinds of questions, you know, things that didn't really seem particularly scholarly before then. So so there was that on the one hand. Um, at the same time that I was sort of doing that in my English courses, uh, I was also sort of looking for a second major or a minor because I had um, I had ideas about maybe going to teachers college because I thought, what else am I going to do with a degree in English? So I was looking for a second a second teachable. Uh, and stumbled into anthropology and uh, really, really enjoyed anthropology, did a minor in anthropology, and then um, as I got closer to graduation, realized I didn't want to go to teacher's college. <laughs> um, didn't know what else I was going to do, but a couple of professors, you know, one in anthropology, one in English, suggested, you know, you should go to grad school. And which hadn't really been something that I, that I thought about before then, but I thought, oh, okay. 
Um, and I knew, so I knew I wanted to sort of look into stuff around bodies, body image, beauty, uh, from a feminist perspective. Um, and I could have really done that, I could have done that in English, sort of, you know, d doing discourse analysis and, and textual analysis and stuff. Um, or um, I could do it in anthropology and do, you know, look at it sort of ethnographically, actually talking to people, and I thought that sounds more, you know, more appealing. Mm -hmm. You know, by the time I was finished my English degree, you know, I'd read <laughs> a bajillion things and I was you know, maybe finally getting tired of reading things. Um, wanted to talk to some real people, so I applied to an anthropology um, master's program at Dalhousie, got in there, um, and did a, did a, did my master's thesis project on uh, young women who self-identify as feminist and their own struggles with um, body image, beauty, and so on. Um, with the idea that sort of, sort of inspired me being that, you know, feminists are sort of supposed to be above it all, you know, we're sort of hairy-legged, Birkenstock-wearing, granola-eating, um, ugly creatures, basically, which obviously didn't, you know, didn't jive with my own experiences of my mm. own life or most of the, the feminist women I knew, so I wanted to sort of um, collect people's narratives about negotiating these two sort of discourses of feminism and femininity, on the other hand. Mm. Um, so that's what I did for my, my master's, and um, I really, you know, really enjoyed doing doing my master's. It was this wonderful sort of time in my life, because you, you know, it can kind of go either way, right? But I really enjoyed it. You just have, you know, if you're, if you're well-funded and stuff, you know, and you can support yourself and worry about, you know, nothing but scholarship for a while. I mean, you really have all this time to just think about ideas and deeply immerse yourself in them. And that for me was really, really great. And I thought, oh, okay, I want to do a PhD. So, but I didn't know what I wanted to do. And then I thought, well, I'll just, I'll propose sort of an extension of my, the project that I was doing um, and looking sort of I, w I proposed doing it from sort of an intergenerational perspective. So looking at, you know, people people in the, the sort of in the late '90s who self-identified as feminists, sort of I guess would have been like third wave feminists, um, and comparing their experiences to those of sort of second wave, so-called bra burning kind of feminists who really took different approaches to these these issues around appearance, supposedly. Uh, so that's what I initially set out to do, mm -hmm. and you mm -hmm. may be wondering, how did she end up doing fieldwork in, in Vanuatu, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so I ended up back at York to do my PhD, um, and I was assigned sort of a temporary um, advisor, uh, who was Margaret Rodman, who ended up becoming my PhD supervisor. She had been doing fieldwork in Vanuatu for like 30 years at that point, mm -hmm. and she had she was in the process of applying for a major research grant and um, and said, you know, if I got money, would you like to, you know, would you like to go to Vanuatu? You know, you could look at, you could look at images around, or, you know, issues around, again, beauty, bodies, dress, all of these things, but in a different sort of place. And at first I was like, no, no thanks. Um, I had this sort of crazy idea that I didn't want to do sort of exotic, you know, I didn't want to do exotic anthropology, you know, going to Melanesia just seemed like, you know, why don't we just go back to 1910 and all be Malinowski, like it seemed very old fashioned, very exotic, um, you know, very sort of far removed from the sort of issues that I was um, sort of interested in in North America. Uh, but then of course I slept on it for a while and I thought someone's offering to pay your way to the South Pacific, like do it, right? Uh, and that's how I ended up doing fieldwork in Vanuatu, where I did mm -hmm. um, my work there was with young women, sort of in their late teens, early 20s, who were, and looking at how they embodied national identity through their dress and comportment practices. Um, and it ended up being a really interesting time to do that work because, because there had been when I got there, there had just recently been a big kerfuffle between sort of um, the group of customary chiefs and parliament. They sort of have two, they have an official parliamentary government system, but then the customary chiefs have a sort of a parallel legal system that it doesn't hold the same weight, but has a lot of um, 
not as much weight legally, but has a lot of influence over what happens in Parliament. And so the customary chiefs wanted to ban women from wearing pants um, because it was seen as being un, uh, both untraditional and unchristian, and therefore detrimental to the health and welfare of the nation as a whole. And women mm -hmm. were sort of put on the hook, the hook for this. Uh, and so it was, you know, this perfect time to talk about these issues because it was on everyone's mind and young women really up in arms mm. about it. So that's what I ended up doing there. And um, since then in Vanuatu I've moved on to looking uh, at men and men's lives and masculinity, working with migrant workers and looking at how having a chance to make, you know, to make money, really a lot of money, relatively speaking, um, is shifting their ideas about, about kinship, about um, you know, about the shape of society, about their role, their role as men, really, um, compared to their, you know, their, their fathers, who were mostly subsistence gardeners for the most part. Mm -hmm. So suddenly there's this major sort of upheaval in their livelihoods that requires, you know, rethinking masculinity. And that's what, that's what I'm doing now. And that's, that's sort of how it all happened. And here I am. Cool. Yes. Yeah, cool narrative. Lots of, yeah, gender themes coming out in there. Yeah. I used to, when I was in grad school, they called me gender girl. <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> Seems like a bit of irony in there, like gender girl, as if it's maybe like they're saying the, you know, category and then label or label label. Yeah, yeah, no, you are, you are correct in, in picking that up. It was not always necessarily, you know, there's this the, the hint of pejorativeness to that, right? Mm -hmm. That you know, studying gender is sort of not serious scholarship, right? It's the scholarship of girls, but... So what do you think uh, are some of the more interesting and valuable pieces of research or ideas that you've picked up? Like, what are the real things that make your work, I don't know, important to you or possibly important to other people? Oh, this is like a job interview now, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Colin. Oh, yeah? Job um, interview question? Yes. Why is your... Why is your, why is your work important? important? Let me rephrase what's, that. What's like, your contribution? Or, yeah, like, what do you... Not necessarily what's your contribution, but, like... I don't know, what, why should other people care about your work? Not not maybe for like a monetary reason, no, no, but no. for a humanistic reason. Yeah. Well, okay. So I often, I mean, in addition to being asked this kind of question, job interview, <laughs> yeah, yeah, job interview um, I mean, I've had students ask specifically about Vanuatu, like what's, what's the use value, right, mm -hmm. in knowing about Vanuatu? Where is it even? Um, you know, it doesn't really loom large in the Canadian imagination. You know, mm -hmm. It's um and in fact until um you know, when I went I barely knew where it was. Um most people I knew didn't know where it was after I came back the first time, um there was a survivor film there, so suddenly oh. people had you know, an image of it at least in their in their minds if it was a somewhat skewed one. Um so yeah, so I mean that's one one variation on this question that I often get from students is why should anyone care about Vanuatu when it's so far away? Um, but, I mean, it is actually, it's a really interesting place that is, has historical, not ties to, but resonances with, I guess, Canada, because it's, um, it was colonized by both the British and the French, um, and so it's a, mm. um, it's actually not just a bilingual country, it's officially a trilingual, because the local lingua franca, um, is also a language, but, um, you know, it's, you go there and it's it's like Canada in the sense that everyone knows at least a little English and a little French. Um, you know, signage is in both languages, sort of mm -hmm. all of these things. And so um, it's interesting from, from that kind of perspective to look at, you know, it's it, it's a British and French colony, or it was just a British and French colony, just like Canada was. Um, so in that sense, it's sort of, you know, it's interesting at that level, sort of at the, you know, from a political science sort of perspective. Um, and you know, Canada Canada gives um, Canada gives development money to mm -hmm. Vanuatu. So um, you know, we are not necessarily un unconnected. Um, mostly through it happens mostly through CUSO, um, which is the Canadian University Students Overseas Program. It's a development program that sends, sends young people over. Um, but also, still lots of Canadian missionaries go to Canada. Um, you know, there are there are, are actually more ties than you might know about. It's also interestingly enough, um, it's one of these places where um, 
uh, shipping companies can flag can flag their ships and dodge taxes. And um, you know, Paul Martin, who was um, who was Paul Martin, uh, a shipping magnate, in, in addition to being um, you know politician, he had ships that were flagged in Vanuatu. So there's all these really interesting sort of connections. So it's you know, it's a faraway place that is actually you know because of globalization, we're more tied in with than we think. So there's that. Mm -hmm. um, I guess more sort of theoretically speaking. You know, the stuff about the stuff about about gender, for instance, and you know about culture more broadly. I mean, I think, and I come this I come at sort of from the perspective of, of a of a teacher because that's mm -hmm. what I'm spending so much of my time doing these days. Uh, I think that you know, Vanuatu again because it's it's similar and it's really really different, right? And so being able to understand people's lives somewhere far away for, like that and understand them on their own terms helps us to, um, on the one hand, interrogate our own common sense assumptions and, and categories and things around gender, um, and to be more understanding of why gender is so different in, in other places. And I mean, I guess, you know, for me, sort of personally, you know, that sort of idea, like that idea that gender, which, you know, as a young woman, I found so you know, restrictive in a lot of ways, which is what, mm -hmm. you know, what drew me to the works that I was interested in in the first place. Um, the idea that it's not the same everywhere and that it's, that it's completely culturally contingent, culturally and historically contingent, that can be really freeing you know, in some ways, or at least it gives you a new tool or a new perspective to think, you know, about, you know, about your own life that, I mean, that sort of personally is why this question of, of gender and cross-cultural perspective has always been such a powerful one to me. Cool. So that's, you know, one, one or two reasons why it matters, I guess. And so, like, tying into your interests for, like, teaching and in the class. Do you think like a lot of these experiences with like gender and vanity uh, sort of address why you care so much about teaching these days? Do you want to, I don't know, be a sort of role model or maybe like a, I don't know, an anthropology sort of therapist for the culture mm -hmm. of women these days? And, and men, right? And men, I mean, yes, I guess yeah, of course with men. Yeah. The, um, because of mm -hmm. course, uh, you know, I add the and men there because of course gender, um, <laughs> you know, really rigid, rigid, you know, rigid, hegemonic ideas about gender are just as damaging to, to men as they, or can be just as damaging to men as they can be to women, um, mm -hmm. and we all have something to gain from questioning, you know, questioning these things and, and you know, rethinking them, um, and opening up more possibilities to everyone, regardless of whether they're men or women. Um, oh God, do I see myself as a role model? Um, I, I suppose I, I should probably mm -hmm. um, because this is on on the one because on the one hand we are seeing um, you know, increasing enrollments of of young women in post secondary education and I think mm -hmm. you know I think more women now go into post secondary ed especially universities than young men but at the same time that we're seeing that. The higher up you go in in post secondary ed, the fewer women you see, um, and if you look at the structure of um, academic labor, the higher up you go, the fewer women you'll see. So mm -hmm. you probably have plenty of women who are um, your instructors, um, you know, maybe even even a majority. But if you look at start looking at department chairs, you'll see fewer women. If you start looking at deans, you'll see fewer women. Um, and that just you know go up to through to you know vice you know vice president president provost um, mm -hmm. you know I say this and our provost is a woman but sort of um, across the board you know you do see fewer and fewer women so I mean I guess it is you know it's in that sense you know I, I suppose it's good that I'm here that I've come this far and in that sense it makes me think you know I should push push on up, you know, if I, if I can, um, and, and be a role model. And I suppose the other thing that, you know, I mean, you should be able to tell I'm not super comfortable with this idea of being a role model per mm -hmm. se, but, um, 
now, especially now, I think I've mentioned this, I don't know if you were, I think you were around the week that I mentioned, you know, now that I have, you know, I have family as well, right? Mm -hmm. um, kids, and I think, um, you know, if I can, maybe not role model necessarily, but, but model somehow, mm -hmm. um, a way to be a working mother and a working scholar, then that's probably a good thing for people to see as well, especially, you know, because our ideas about, you know, who should work, what kind of work is worth doing, should people stay home or not stay home, you know, are you being, are you being a bad feminist if you don't, you know, keep working? Uh, it's so, everything is so much more complicated than that. And to, you know, and so to sort of be, you know, to be living it and being like, this is, you know, this is my life. Colin, I have to <laughs> cancel this interview 10 times because my kids are sick, sorry. Um, it, it puts a, you know, a real, you know, a reality to all of the competing sort of myths about, about that sort of, sort of stuff. So that, in that sense, I guess that's important. As well to me, although I don't usually think of it explicitly, but it's probably there somehow. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because like certainly these days, I think whenever people get started researching or talking about gender, like power dynamics and social roles come up. Mm -hmm. And like as an educator or as a professor or as a, I know the head of a family, I'm constantly interested in these questions, but also interested in like how you manage to, you know, be a cool professor <laughs> and still being, you know, under all these different pressures of gender. And the same thing applies to, you know, men in different ways, mm -hmm. I imagine. But as you mentioned, left like, you know, the administration at a university and not only gender, but of course, like race and other things yeah, yeah, come yeah. into it, which we haven't really talked yeah, about yet. Not yet. <laughs> <laughs> not yet. Yeah. So, yeah, what are other, like, I don't know, strategies or interesting stories you have to tell about, uh, you know, oh, you know, your role as an educator and a woman, or as an educator and as an anthropologist that might have, I don't know, been spun differently if you were, I don't know, came from a different background. Yeah. I mean, yeah. <laughs> Probably, yeah, yeah. yeah. But what? Um, well, it's interesting that I mean we talk about different backgrounds um, because obviously you, your tape recorder can't see this, but um, I am white, mm -hmm. and I have no doubt that much of what I've been able to accomplish is you know, on the, you know, on the on the grounds on the grounds of that, um, and I mean that is certainly I mean if I were a student at UTSC. I, one thing, I mean, it's, it, it's glaringly obvious to me as a professor is that, you know, I look out at my students at a sea of brown and, and shades, you know, variations mm -hmm. of brown shades, um, and I know students aren't seeing that when they, they look back at their professors for the most part, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so, I mean, that's something that I hope... And I guess also one of the things I like about studying at UTSC is if you know people can start to to see themselves you know in the in this kind of role. I mean that's what people need to see, right? Is that oh maybe mm -hmm. you know maybe I could do that, right? Um, because the one thing I mean that I have experienced from my own background, and I don't want like I don't want to make one category trump another category. You know, it's not the it's not the oppression Olympics, um, but. Um, I mean, I have also, in addition to benefiting from my whiteness, I have also benefited from the opening up of the university to, um, you know, of access to the university to people of all class backgrounds, um, mm -hmm. you know, at least in theory, although it's obviously, it's crazy expensive, and a lot of that opening up has just been done by, you know, making people go into debt forever, but, mm -hmm. um, <laughs> but I guess more, more when I was going through, there was a lot more, um, there were more grants, I think, and a more, you know, more effort to get people sort of from, with class backgrounds that, where they never would have gone to university to go to university. So I'm the first person in my, you know, in my family, um, to go, to go to university, you know, at all, uh, much less go on, mm -hmm. you know, to get an advanced, advanced degree. And I'm actually, 
um, I'm still the only person, um, you know, to go to university, which is sort of, I mean, it's ex ex for my, my sister. Um, but I'm, I'm the only one to finish, to finish a BA. So, like, I was the only one, you know, when I went through, and I'm, I'm you know, I'm the oldest of, like, 20 cousins, and I'm the, still the only one to have gone through. So, I mean, in a lot of ways, I mean, class really, you know, we never talk about, you know, we don't talk about class anymore, but... Um, but class and the ways that it's intertwined with all these other sort of, you know, with race and with, with gender and so on is, where I don't even remember what your original question was, but, <laughs> um, you know, I think that class is still a huge barrier to success in mm -hmm. academia. Um, you know, both like coming up you know, to the level that, that I'm working at now, but just for getting, you know, for getting through undergrad. You know, if you, you know, if you come from a family where no one's ever gone to university, um, you don't have the kind of backup that someone whose parents went to, you know, whose parents work, went, you know, went to university or work in a university. I mean, I mean you just don't have the kind, you, know, you don't have the habitus, right? Mm -hmm. um, to, you know, to borrow from something we've been talking about in class. And so you have to, you know, in addition to learning all the stuff you're learning, you have to learn how to be in university, and you're doing it without, you know, without, you're doing it blind, basically. And I think we really discount the significance of that for, for undergraduate student success, actually. I think there's a lot, a lot of a lot of the sort of anxiety that you know that I see in students about about success is because they haven't they don't have that background to to draw on and you know, students whose parents you know who went to university or come from you know many generations of students who went to university have a much um, seem to have an easier time at least you know navigating the the ins and outs of, of university and, and and managing in some ways because they you know they have they have some sense of what what to expect. Mm -hmm. um, that's like uh, gone way off from what you originally asked me, I think. But mm -hmm. so I'll stop talking. Right yeah. To jump around totally, uh, what are some of the things you're researching today and that you're really interested in? So I know most of the stuff you're doing today is teaching wise, right? But are there other, like, I don't know, more academic or interesting things you're yeah. getting into? Yeah. Of course, of course. Um, mm -hmm. Because of the nature of my my appointment right now, as you said, teaching sort of takes up the bulk of you know the bulk of my time, and it's mm -hmm. it's it's sort of meant to. Um, but that doesn't mean my intellectual <laughs> curiosity goes away. So, um, I mean, I'm working in terms of writing. I'm working on writing up the material um, with the migrant workers, um, so the stuff mm -hmm. on masculinity and migration, um, and working on. I mean, if I say this on tape, this will make me actually get to work on it. <laughs> um, I'm working on a book proposal based on my work in Vanuatu, um, mm -hmm. both with young men and young women, uh, about social change, particularly in the main capital, uh, the capital city there, Port Vila, and how um, um, the, the the rapid shifts in in the rapid upheaval, really, in in the social fabric that's been wrought by increased urbanization and increased opportunities for wage labor. Uh, so working on a book about that, hmm. um, but also, um, you know, as I as I mentioned, I do sort of need to stick closer to home right mm -hmm. now um, for for sort of family reasons. It's you know it's hard to envision going to the South Pacific with toddlers in tow. I hope to I hope to do it in a few you know in a few years, mm -hmm. but probably not right now. So I mean that means I'm not going to get a lot of um, you know a lot of new data from Vanuatu anytime soon. Um, so I've been thinking about, you know, local, more local projects that I could work on. And one that, I, one that I've been working on really, really slowly, but which I hope to be able to get into in a little more depth next year when I'm on, when I'm on leave, is um, a project on, on runners. Um, so this, you know, is picking up on my ongoing interest in, in, the, in the body, basically. Mm -hmm. um, because I've always been fascinated by, uh, I mean, first of all, by people that run at all, <laughs> because it's not really my my thing. I'm like a fair weather runner at best, mm -hmm. and only, yeah, you because know, I feel like I have to, not out of any sort of love for, for running. But um, 
I mean, it's as I, again, it's sort of as I get older, I see more and more people taking up running, and I'm really interested in, especially in the relationship between running on the one hand and, um, and charity on the other hand, like how, you know, you could ask someone for, you know, 50 bucks for multiple, to fight multiple sclero sclerosis, but they're much more likely to give it to you if you say, I'm going to run 10 kilometers, but you give me 50 bucks. Um, and so what, like, I'm curious, and what is the connection there between, you know, the doing good of, of, of charity and the body of the runner? So, I mean, partly what I'm sort of hypothesizing and what I want to flesh out a little more ethnographically is, um, you know, I think the bodies, you know, I think the running body is, is a virtuous body, right? It's the body of someone who works hard, is disciplined, uh, you know, takes care of themselves, mm -hmm. all of these sorts of things, and I, I, I want to see how is it that, you know, corporate charities, it's usually big corporate charities, harness that sort of um, sense of virtuousness and you know, really employ the labor of, uh, of runners <laughs> in some ways to, to make money. Um, so what I've, I mean, I've, I've, what I'm sort of thinking about and what I've proposed to do is to actually, like, you know, join a running group and take up running and sort of do um, like a multi-pronged kind of approach. So on the one hand, looking at these issues of sort of running and charity, but then also doing a more, you know, sort of doing what Louis Waquant did about boxing, right? Like actually, mm -hmm. you're right about, you know, becoming a runner um, and do a sort of embodied field work. Of course, the, the big problem with this is that I have to become a runner, <laughs> right? Yeah. Um, I mean, and that's, that's also the, that's the big problem with it and the, sort of appealing part as well, right? It's like, okay, mm -hmm. kill, kill at least two birds with one stone. Uh, so that's, that's something that, again, I've, I mean, I've had more, <laughs> I've had more, uh, partly I haven't had a lot of time, and partly I have, I've had more luck getting myself to think about the part where I can think about it at my desk than the actual getting mm -hmm. up and, and running, mm -hmm. and running part, but I do, I do want to sort of do that. And um, so that's, that's the big thing. And then I guess the other thing that I'm just starting to think about, and I'm, I mean, I'd be curious to hear if you have any contributions, mm -hmm. um, especially because now I'm in this, this more teaching intensive position. Mm -hmm. um, I am always thinking about yeah, the contemporary university and sort of the condition, the student condition, I suppose. Because um, if you, you know, if you could listen in on you know, professors, you know, professors talking among themselves, you know, you would hear, you know, in our worst moments anyways, how we're all just beside ourselves by how many students are coming, you know, come to class, you know, don't do their readings, can't write a sentence, are always on their, you know, always on their phones, all of the, we have a sort of a, a, sen a set of ideas that we readily apply to, to students. Mm -hmm. Um, but what I would like to do is somehow figure out how to sort of ethnographically figure out how much of that is stereotype and how much of it is a real generational difference in student sort of expectations and, and behaviors. Mm -hmm. Um, and I mean, the reason that I want to do this is I think that when we, when we sort of talk about this in sort of corridor talk, I mean, we really, we really do sort of tend to blame you know, to blame the students, right? Yeah. You know, it's like it's like kids these days becomes sort of the explanation, um, and obviously, you know, as as scholars, we know that it's more complicated than that. But it's you know, it's a nice easy shorthand for mm -hmm. venting our own frustration. Um, so I guess I mean, what I want to think about is what does it mean to be a student in neoliberal times, basically, and how are students? study habits, approaches to the work, expectations and so on, how are they, you know, indicative of or reflective of, um, you know, the neoliberalization of, of the academy and really of even high school. Um, so what that would look like, I don't really know, mm -hmm. but um, I just have, I, I really think, you know, all this stuff that we, we worry about it all the time, we talk about it, but I think having some sort of ethnographic study of that might mm -hmm. actually help us to figure out what's, you know, what's going on and then figure out, figure out solutions. Um, I methodologically it poses some problems because, you know, I'm not sure how many students are going to, you know, I can't, I can't blend in, right? <laughs> I don't think, right, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, I'm not Drew Barrymore in whatever movie <laughs> that, you know, that was where she, she did that. 
Um, you know, so I can't, I don't really think I could do, you know, first-hand kind of go back to school mm -hmm. field work, I don't think. Um, so that would leave me doing sort of interviews, and it might be better, you know, this is something I see myself maybe recruiting a lot of, st of student mm -hmm. students to work on this project and doing something sort of collaborative. So that is just in the thought stages right now, but mm -hmm. I think mm -hmm. um, it's a, it would be a really nice way to tie in all the teaching that I do with, you know, a research project. Mm hmm yeah. yeah. Sort of when you're talking about the runners especially in this mm. too a bit, there's, there seems to be like a real interesting distinction between like just writing about runners or writing mm -hmm. about like the neoliberal like mm. education system and whatnot, you know, something you could do from your desk in English. Yeah, yeah. But for the anthropologist, like, yeah, you have to like go to Vanity or you go on the jogs yeah. Yeah. and you really embody, you know, a lot of what you're studying. Yeah. So what do you think like sort of drew you drew you towards that in your in your narrative like you talked about moving from english to anthropology and do you still really see find or do you really find more interest in these different embodied ways of learning um okay i'll answer the second question yeah, first, yeah. which is yes <laughs> um i do and so and i think it actually yeah i just think it's a better way of getting getting at stuff, right, of collecting mm -hmm. data, of getting to the heart of things. Um, you know, maybe I've just drank the anthropological Kool-Aid <laughs> too much, but I, I, I just, I have, a, I have a strong belief that it is one of the, it's one of the strongest tools, sort of methodological tools that we have mm -hmm. um, for gaining, you know, information that I mean, can't replace, you know, historical work or archival work or statistical work, but um, that really supplements it in a really, really important way. Mm -hmm. Um, but why? What, why was I drawn to that? Um, I guess... Um, I mean, it sort of, it goes back to... Um, it goes back to this, this, sort of, this sort of moment where I was trying to decide between going to grad school in English and going to grad school in anthropology. Um, and was, you know, had really been working you know, had read Susan Bordeaux's book in a couple of different classes, was sort of looking at it from different perspectives. And the English class that I had read it in was a semiotics class. Mm -hmm. So very sort of text, symbols, discourse, analysis um, based, which was really, you know, really fun. But, you know, begged the question, what does this look like on the ground, right? Mm -hmm. Which is exactly what that's where the anthropology comes in, right? Like, how, how does, what does this look like on the ground? And that just seemed much more appealing to me. Um, and I think, um, you know, at that time as well, I was sort of, I, you know, I didn't know if I would, you know, I didn't know that I would go on to do a PhD. Um, and so I was saying, okay, well, what will I do after I do a master's if I do that? And it just, it, there's something with the, the practicality of it that was appealing at the time too. Like, okay, I'm gonna, mm -hmm. I'm gonna get real life skills you know, <laughs> for the for the job market. Um, so that I mean that was part of the appeal too, right? Mm -hmm. Like I think, and this is doing I think an injustice perhaps to the you know to the humanities to say that the social sciences are more <laughs> practical than the humanities. I don't really believe that mm -hmm. um, because I think um, you know in the humanities you gain you gain the same kinds of thinking skills and a lot, a lot of the same skills, but I guess it's, it's in the actual application that I was, um, I found it more appealing. And yeah, and, the, and once, I, once I did field work in Vanuatu, that was it. I was like, yeah. this is awesome. I loved, I loved doing field work so much. It was, it was great. It's just another, it just adds a whole new level and becomes you know, it becomes embodied and sensory and it, it's just coming at you from a billion different directions instead of coming up off the page. So it's just more, right? It's like, it's like scholarship on, on acid or something. <laughs> I don't know. Um, you know, it's just, there's just, just more. It's, it's great. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. what I think. Yeah, no, I think that 
like this is something like I've thought about in a bunch of other disciplines or whatever. But mm -hmm. I'm really into like Zen and Buddhism and whatnot, mm -hmm. and also like cognitive science and wisdom stuff. And uh, I read this book, uh, Siddhartha, and then mm -hmm. I watched like some John Berwicky Cognitive Science of Wisdom lecture. Mm -hmm. And I think there's a new way to understand a point that I really liked, was mm -hmm. that a lot of us have sort of these uh, propositional forms of knowledge mm -hmm. that we usually learn like the classroom, like this is an idea, this is knowledge, one plus one is two, you know. Mm -hmm all these different propositions. But then there's this weird procedural kind of knowledge, like the felt, the embodied kinds of knowledge, this sort of like mindfulness. Like it's not something necessarily like explicit in your mind, but it's something implicit, it's something that you do. And I think that's something, I don't know, that I find really interesting about anthropology as a discipline when you compare it to English, mm -hmm. that there's a lot of cool stuff going on in your head, but you also really get the feeling the feelings of it, and even when you're reading some of the works, mm -hmm. uh, you can be like, "Wow, that that's that that really hits on, a, on an almost implicit like psychological level." Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I find that yeah interesting as as far as it might draw you and other people and me to anthropology yeah. as a discipline. Yeah, we're, we're kindred spirits or something. <laughs> like, I mean, obviously, it's not for everyone, right? Or like, mm -hmm. everyone would be an anthropologist, but um, <laughs> but if it grabs you, I think it just it. It really grabs you. Cool. Yeah. Cool. Do you have any other, uh, I don't know, questions, comments, to the thoughts on your mind? I can't think of anything. Um, no, I feel like I've mostly just been cool. rambling. But no, this is this is interesting. But I can't think of anything I'd I'd add at this point. Totally cool. Just yeah. like yeah, sometimes it's just something like somebody's about to say mm. and they haven't yet said. But yeah, that's what I asked that question for. Yeah. And now uh, I'll throw my fancy last question. Uh oh. Are you ready? Okay. Okay. So if you had to give, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> I knew it was going to be much, one of these. Too much. Okay. If you had to give a thirty-second speech to the world, what would it be? You know, a really corny last question. Like, what would your message to the world be? But it has to be like thirty seconds. Okay. Or five I'm going to steal somebody else's because I just heard this yesterday. I've been dying yeah. to say it to someone else, um, and it. <laughs> It vaguely applies to some of the stuff that we were talking about hmm. earlier about gender. I've already used up many of my seconds. Um, this is something that like Courtney Love tweeted recently, uh, but it was don't you know don't maim yourself, mutilate yourself, turn yourself you know upside down, trying to you know win over the football captain. Be the football captain. <laughs> uh, it was for International Women's Day and. You know, as sort of American specific as that is, yeah. as that is with the football thing. I mean, that really. Um, I think it's true. Um, mm -hmm. Don't be be the be the thing. Be it rather than being a sidekick. I suppose. Cool. Yeah. Rock and roll. Wow. Yes, indeed. <laughs> indeed. Well, thank you very much. You're That's welcome. Pretty much my battery of questions for today. That was great. That was good. Yeah.